Hello and welcome back to Uro Uro Niwa. I'm Mike Charlton. In the last episode we looked at making a world in Dwarf Fortress and in this episode we're going to look at a little bit of the history of that world. We, we were looking at the historical map for a while at the end of the last episode uh, but this time I want to look at more detail about the history. Uh, before I start though, you might be wondering actually, I, ne I never said in the beginning episode what Uro Uro Niwa means. It's Japanese, I live in Japan and I speak Japanese badly as you can tell. Uro Uro means uh, to hang around doing nothing or to wander around doing nothing well, whereas Niwa means a garden and Uro Uro Niwa just means the garden where you hang around and do nothing and that's why it's this channel is called that because <laughs> we're not going to do anything really earth shaking here it's just going to be fun in, in fact it's kind of the the code word for my programming project the game that I'm going to be making it may not be the name of the game but for a while I'm going to use that that name let's get on with the game last time we created a new world using the create new world parameters and uh, now uh, we're going to go back again so we're going to start playing um, if you remember it's region 4 and we're going into legends mode now in fortress mode or adventure mode usually you save your game and then you continue playing but in legends mode you don't save there's nothing to save so you quit and start again so every time you use legends mode you start again I'm quickly going to look at the historical map again um, and if you remember uh, what it looks like so you'll see here this is a city, it's a human city with uh, three lines. This is an elvish retreat. Um, I think it's actually meant to be a very large tree and in surrounding it actually you can see these up arrows. These are actually pine trees. So once you see it, you can't really unsee it, can you? It's actually pretty easy. And then you see these kind of, this end like or arch thing here. These are actually just hills, um, little pointier hills are kind of like mountains a uh, big triangle here that's a big mountain you can see that and down here you can see there's actually a little carrot that little carrot means that it's a very very high peak this kind of club or whatever it is I guess it's a spade isn't it is actually a deciduous leaf tree because it looks a bit like a leaf here you you can see there's these black lines of roads the blue lines are major rivers going back to this civilizations there's the if you remember there's the dwarven fortress here it's an omega and there's another dwarven fortress here uh, another elven set settlement over here and then over on the right hand side you see a human city uh, it's a plus the human cities are actually hard to see I find like the the lines and the pluses are actually quite hard to see the, there's also, I think, asterisks once they get quite large. The, the different symbols to actually denote different states of the city. And in fact, if I go forward one year, like we did before, you'll notice, in fact, actually, that this dwarven city became a mu. In fact, I think it's a good opportunity for us to check it on the wiki. So let's just go to the wiki. I'm just going to run Chromium. If you just search in Google for... Um, dwarf fortress wiki you will find it and that's probably the dwarf fortress wiki is really the the place for all information essentially in fact I usually don't go straight here and look I, I admit that I actually just search on Google for everything so if I say if I say dwarf fortress map symbols then you see it always gives me uh, a link. The the ones you usually want are the DF 2014. That's the latest version. And here you can see the symbols that are used. So it's not necessarily really to memorize them. As long as you have kind of an idea of what they mean, um, then these kinds of symbols you can go and look at the the legend later. Um, so, but what I was interested in was why the, the, the there is a difference between, for instance, mountain halls, hillocks, and fortresses. I, I won't go, get into it too much 
now because once we play adventure mode it'll be really obvious <laughs> the difference and you'll see them but what I'm looking at so what you can see here the uh, mu sign is actually a ruin so when we go back here you can see in fact that these towns have been ruined and so what's really interesting about here is in the year 10 um, this civilization has two ruined so this is the civilization if I put the cursor over them again you can grab them up here you can see this is for the dwarven civilization of the town of sculpture so that's the civilization name here the civilization name again is town of sculpture if I go down here this is disputed land it's either the exalted shield or this town of sculpture and and this is the name of the city uh, Toulon Dolush uh, the way it works is the land is kind of claimed by a civilization and you have like this disputed area uh, where you're not quite sure which country owns the land but the the cities themselves have a government and that government aligns itself to one civilization or the other so in this particular case Tulum Dolish is a city in land that is claimed by both of these civilizations but the city itself has an allegiance to only one of these civilizations and that depends on its government I can tell you from looking at it I, I'm pretty sure that this is actually a, a town from the Exalted Shield and this is a fortress you can see because it's got the white now as we actually go through the history you'll see in fact that the town of sculpture gets less and less land in fact here it only has one piece of land that is undisputed so this is the only piece of land that's undisputed and owned by them every other piece of land that they have is or is claimed by both um, and then if I go to year 30, you see that every single, every single tile that the Town of Sculptures claims is also claimed by the Exalted Shield. As soon as all of the dwarves or all of the beings that kind of associate themselves with a civilization have died off, then this civilization will actually disappear from the map. So we know there's at least one surviving member of this civilization who keeps claim to this land. Now, it's interesting, we can actually look at these cities and try and figure out where these people might be. And I think it may be a nice, a nice next step in this process. So why don't we do that? So I'm in the Dwarf Fortress directory and I've listed my files and these are the files that I have. And you, you can see actually that there's a couple of text files. The ones I want you to look at are the worldhistory.txt and the world sites and population.txt. Um, if you remember, we exported this map gen info by pressing P in the last episode, and that generated these text files. Now these text files are really interesting, and I'm just going to I'm just going to look at them now. One thing I'll, I'll point out is I don't have the correct font on here. So I, I have a Japanese font on here, so I can type Japanese, but I don't have dwarfish characters on here. So there will be some characters it renders incorrectly when I view this. So just be aware of that when I look at this. So I'll just use, I'm actually just going to use a pager called less. This just lists a file. So if we go region four, zero, zero, whatever world. So we're going to actually look at the world sites and, and population. And this gives you information about, about the world. And it is really quite amazing. And just before I, st I get into it, you, you'll see here is where, you know, the rendering didn't happen properly. So there's a, there's a dwarvish character here that I don't, render properly because I don't have the proper glyph in my font but at the beginning of this file you see you have the world population and, and this world this is at this current time at uh, the year 125 so at the year 125 we have uh, 7,000 dwarves about 8,000 humans almost 5,000 elves there's 17,000 goblins Remember the goblins were up in the north and up in, and down in the south and they're not really interacting with any other civilizations so they've had no wars. Goblins also breed very very quickly so this is why their numbers are much much higher. Usually in older worlds the goblins will very frequently overrun the world because they can be quite powerful. And then we have only 382 goblins. Um, as I suspected earlier they're having a hard time because they're getting they're they're squashed between two populations 
Uh, and total population is 38,181. Now, not all of this population, if I understand correctly, uh, and I may not, if, if you actually have better information, then um, feel free to comment in the comments. But my understanding of this is that not all of these are actually notable creatures. Now, there's a, there's a concept of notability. There are creatures that are in the world, just because they're in the world, and there are creatures that are there that are playing kind of an active role in the world. And those creatures are notable. And if I remember correctly, when we did the generation of the world, it told us how many you know, historical figures there are. I seem to remember it was something like around 5,000, which means that there's about 33,000 which are not notable. So they are basically uh, populations which are statistically in the areas, but for where they don't actually have a character. There's 134 kobolds in the Pale Gloom, but they're not necessarily named kobolds. They don't have a name. Um, the game just kind of brings them in and out of existence as it, as it needs to. It tracks where they are generally, as a population, but they're not tracked individually as single characters. Anyway, having said that, let's have a look. Let's have a look at these uh, towns. So, um, here we have this town. It's called Besmar Lular. Besmar Lular. And what I can do here is I can actually just search for that. I go Besmar. That's, that's probably good enough. But you can see here. So Besmar Lular is in English is called Pulley Pulley Rooters. And you'll see there has a population of exactly one dwarf. So that's that's kind of like not particularly interesting, right? Um, it is actually interesting from a historical perspective, but from a from a fortress perspective, there's nothing going on there. It seems. Let's go. Let's go somewhere else. Some some place that's actually more interesting. Let's just go to here's Kogan Tatlosh, and this is this is called uh, boat fish in English. Uh, and this is a fortress of the Exalted Shield. Now remember we have the two Dwarvish civilizations. There is the Exalted Shield and the other one was called, I forget now, it's called the Town of Sculpture. So the Town of Sculpture. Boatfish had, has this parent civilization, has an owner, right? The owner is the actual, this is the government. So the Craterous Town is, is the government of Boatfish. So when we looked at the previous one, let's go back down to Besmar Lular, the pulley rooters, you'll notice that it's not owned by anybody. There's one dwarf living in it and it's not owned by anyone. And that's because it's a ruin, all right? So here you can see the mew here, it's a ruin, um, and so it's not actually owned by anybody. However, if I go up to this one, you'll see, in fact, this is Ustuth Noram. Ustuth Noram. So let's actually just search for that. Ustuth there it is and this is fence relief this is a hillock owned by the exalted shields now what's interesting about this hillock is that it is a ruin right you see it's a mew it's a ruin and even if we go i'm just going to go backwards in time and then wrap around to the front it was a ruin and then it became a hillock for for the exalted shield all right so something has happened here in this world. And if we look, for instance, like I'm just going to go back up. I'm just going to search for um, the statue of, uh, what is it again? <laughs> the town of sculpture, the town of sculpture. All right, I'll just search for sculpture. Sculpture. All right, so there's a there's a Lord called uh, Zuspa Sculpture Terror. And that's not what we're looking for. I'm just going to look for the next one and pattern not found. What this means is there are no there are no towns owned by the the town of sculpture. There were only these two towns it seems. One which was which was so there's Ustut Noram, which is I forget what it's called in English, and then there's Bez Warlular, which was Puli Puli Rooters. If I go back to Ustut Probably good enough. Yeah, fence relief. 
It's really hard to remember these names because they mean nothing. <laughs> but once you get used to them, eventually it gets into your head. So, so we've got these two tabs. So we've got we've got uh, pulley rooters, and we have uh, fence relief. And these were these were originally towns from the town of Sculpture, it seems, but they were ruined somehow. And um, this one was then taken over by the Exalted Shield. So why don't we try and find out what happened? So I think this is this is the part that is interesting, because the information can be quite overwhelming if you are thinking, okay, um, what am I going to look for? But I think it's more interesting, for instance, if you start to see something that's happened in the world and then you try to investigate that thing. Because then, then you find the history. If you just try and read it from the beginning, it's actually quite difficult to read. So the first thing we can do is we can actually just look at the history of those sites. So I'll go to this sites one here and I'm actually just going to look for the capital, I think we'll, we'll just look for. And I'm just going to, so you press F to filter. So you press F to filter, and I'm just going to look up pulley routers, and then I press return to stop filtering. So now I've got pulley routers, and I'm just going to press return, and it gives me the history of pulley routers. This is everything that's happened in pulley routers from the beginning. So let's, let's quickly go through it. I'm not going to read everything. Pulley routers was a fortress. It was, it started in the year one. It was founded by the muscular rock. Now the muscular rock is a group. The, you have to understand kind of the structure in Dwarf Fortress. You have you have civilizations which have a name, and the civilization in this case is called the Town of Sculpture. And then you have groups that are within that civilization. In this particular case, the muscular rock is kind of a government that founded pulley rooters. There are some dwarves who joined pulley rooters, uh, Zasset Quickness Helms. Uh, Odom Metal Fells, uh, Amust Bridge Murders, uh, English Girder Steer, Udal Dagger Guild, and Zulgar Twinkle Blockades. I really like that name. As Zulgar, <laughs> Zug, Z sorry, Zuglar Twinkle Blockades. He's likely dead. In fact, I'm I'm curious because I I I know this is kind of going down a rat hole a bit, but I I just want to to check because he has such a great name. Let's actually check on to see if this guy is still alive. So let's look up. If I press escape to get out of the sites, you have to do it twice. Then I can search on historical finger figures. And I'm again, I just use F for filter and I'm going to look up Twinkle Blockades. There we go. So Twinkle Blockades is a female dwarf. Uh, one thing that's confusing about dwarvish names, actually there's two things that are very confusing about dwarvish names is one is they are neither male nor female. The other thing is is that this Twinkle Blockade is not their family name. Uh, dwarven uh, culture and actually the humans and all of the names in the game, they don't keep track of the family entities with their names. The families are recorded in the game but their names don't distinguish them. So the first name is kind of a is one word and the second name is two words put together and it's always that way. This is just to distinguish this from some other person who could be called Zuglar. All right so let's click on Zuglar and uh, oh this is very interesting. So Zuglar Twinkle Blockades was a dwarf. She was one of the first of her kind. That means that she was born uh, before history. So she's before, born before the year one. She became a ranger in Pulley Rooters. In the late autumn she was in a foot race. Uh, she did not win because Autumn Metalfells won. But they had a battle axe throwing competition and she was the victor, which is fantastic. Well done, Zuglar. Uh, she, the next year she shot, stopped being a ranger and she moved to Fence Relief. So you remember Fence Relief is the other town where, yeah, the town of sculptures. The town of sculptures. I, I'll get it eventually. <laughs> in the late spring, the Blizzard Man, Len failed versus now Blizzard Man. This so this is some kind of man who's made out of snow, I think, um, and he has actually a, he has a title, the Touch of Iron. So he actually attacked Zuglar, and it seems that um, Zuglar did not win that fight, but she managed to escape without injury, which is well done, Zuglar. 
but unfortunately in the year nine she was struck down by a dragon <laughs> so the poor <laughs> poor girl um, she was killed by the dragon Asunza hot treasure the gold of gilding now some some you'll notice actually that that two of these things the blizzard man and the dragon actually have titles you get a title once you are super notable uh, usually by killing many things and they carry that title for the rest of their life but um, given that Zuglar was killed by a dragon it is possible that the dragon also destroyed the town because we know the town was destroyed before the year 10 and so she was she was killed in the year 9 by a dragon I think that's pretty pretty <laughs> really good evidence that probably the town was destroyed then in fact let's even though I was looking to the capital let's actually just search for fence relief and see if I'm right so here is fence relief so who's to is around and so lots of things happened uh, <laughs> this is interesting <laughs> in the late winter of four a cranberry was stolen <laughs> by an Etten <laughs> well that is absolutely awful <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure why that merits a historical note, but um, I suppose if an Etten comes to your town and steals a cranberry, people remember it. <laughs> so yeah, and you can see in two, uh, Zoglar uh, settled in Fence Relief, and this she was probably part of this group, the Lantern of Trailing, which founded Fence Relief in two. So these are probably the original uh, dwarves that, that founded uh, Fence Relief. And you can see the Blizzard Man actually came uh, and attacked many people. Um, and then actually a dwarf was abducted by a goblin. So another Blizzard, blizzard oh same Blizzard Man, so this is the second time he atta attacked. And now we get into 9, we can see that the Dragon Uzma Hot Treasure, the Gold of Gilding, um, attacked in the midwinter. She attacked the Lantern of Trailing, which if you remember correctly that is the that is the government of Fence Relief. That's the group, founding group. And then you can see that there was a fight. So Imus uh, Gerderster lost her back tooth, which is, which is again, horrible, um, and, and then was killed. The dwarf Zaglar was killed. The dwarf Amost Bridge Murders was also killed. The dwarf Udal Daggergilt was killed. And the dwarf Rovod per Perplex Basements attacked the dragon and then was struck down. At that point the dragon pretty much had killed everybody and, and therefore routed the uh, government, the Lantern of Trailing, and then destroyed Fentralief. So this is what happened. But in the year 42, the Crypts of Ice, another group, from the Exalted Shield, remember that's the other Dwarven civilization, launched an expedition to reclaim Fentralief. So they brought some dwarves in to reclaim fence relief. So now the Crypts of Ice from the Exalted Shields took over and these are the these are the people who initially uh, settled in fence relief. And you can see it's had it's had a rich history since then. I'm going to quickly just finish off what we were doing before, which is to look at a what is it called again? It's pulley pulley something, isn't it? So I'll just look for pulley and see if it, Oh there we go. Ah pulley rooters, that's it. Bez, Bezmar Lula. Um, so what happened to Besmar Lular? Because it was also destroyed, and it's possible it was also destroyed by the same dragon. So we can see. Now, um, you can see that um, this is where uh, poor Zog Zoglar left Polyrooters to start up a new town and was unfortunately killed by a dragon. Um, and you will see here that there was an attack in four by a mountain titan. Uh, here we have the mountain titan Lorsith Crested Tufts, the Cobalt Dawn, attacked the muscular rock at Polyridge. So basically the titan came in here and it looks like the titan hmm, may have destroyed <laughs> the town. And in fact it appears that the titan killed everybody and you can see here that they routed the muscular rock of the town of sculpture and destroyed polyrooters. Now, in the early spring of 15, the dwarf Zong Prestige Papers returned to polyrooters for some reason. And then he left. Doesn't say where. 
came back in mid-autumn of 18, came back in the mid-spring of 35, and came back in the mid-spring of 54. So he's going away and coming back, going away and coming back for some reason. And he's the only dwarf. And remember, when we looked at Polly Rooters, there's one dwarf. And that dwarf happens to be Zahn Prestige Papers. I'm going to show you the other text, which is the World History. World History text. This is also very interesting because it tells you, it's a much shorter file, it tells you the history of all of the civilizations of the world in very brief form. So you can see that there are some animal men in this world as well. There's quite a few of them. There's cave swallow men, serpent men, amphibian men, rodent men. But because they don't form civilizations, um, there's nothing to say. Uh, and we're just going to go down a bit. Now here is the civilization, the Exalted Shields. Um, the game actually has uh, deities in it, and each civilization has their own deities, and so it lists them all here. You'll see it also lists the kings. So we have English uh, Toolball, which is a wonderful name. The next king was Mad Mafo Spread Andrews, and so it goes on like that. But what I'm actually interested in is not um, the Exalted Shields, I'm actually interested in the... I'm actually interested in the town of sculptures. Now what's interesting about these kings here is that we have Vukar Tapered Lash, who's the first king, and he died in the year four. He had two children who were two and one when he died. And then we have Rovad Perplexed Basements, who uh, died in the year nine and had no children. So that that's the end of the line. There are no more there's there are no more kings and queens in the in the civilization. Now you'll notice this year nine, right? Rovad perplexed basements. And if if you have a really good memory, you may actually remember, in fact, that this was the last person killed by the dragon in Usumza. Rovad perplexed basements was not in the capital of the civilization. She was actually in, not Pulley Rooters, she was in the other one. If I go, Ustuth, Ustuth Noram, yeah, Fence Relief. So she was actually in Fence Relief. So I'll just page down here. And you will see, in year of nine, Rova Perplexed Basements was struck down by a dragon. So she was actually, or he or she, I think it may be he, uh, he was actually the king. The interesting thing for me are these two children that survived. You will say these are basically the rightful heirs to the line of the Town of Sculptures, right? So I always think like, what happened to them? Let's have a look. So what we can do is we're, again, we're going to go to historical figures and now we're going to filter again for Vukar Tapered Lash. There we go. Ah, Vukar Tapered Lash was actually a, a woman, so she was a queen. She attacked a mountain titan in four, and then she was killed in four. Oh, I see. I didn't actually understand this before. So what happened was she was the queen of the town of sculptures, and Ravod moved to Pulley Rooters before this happened, and became queen in Pulley Rooters once. Once uh, Vukar died, uh, Rovod actually became king or queen. Um, so that's what happened when the mountain titan destroyed Pulley Rooters. That instantly made Rovod the king or queen. And because that, that king or queen actually had no children. And what we can see is that Zacid Quickness Helms, her husband, died in four. So uh, almost certainly Zacid Quickness Helms was killed uh, by the Titan, and I think we did actually see that. And also, her only daughter, who was born in three, and there was only one, was killed in four as well, so probably also killed by the Mountain Titan. But her son survived. Somehow he was two, and he survived, and in fact, he's likely to be the only surviving member of this civilization. You'll recognize his name, perhaps. Zon Prestige Papers was in fact, if we go back to site list and we look for pulley rooters again, again pulley rooters, 
That's why I saw polyurethers. All right, and I think you will find, as we get down to the bottom here, that in fact, in the spring of 15, Zahn Prestige Papers returned to polyurethers. So this is when he was 13. So dwarves actually become adults when they're 12. Zahn was in hiding somewhere and then returned to polyurethers and presumably and he's the rightful heir to the throne but he may be the only surviving member of his civilization and so he's basically stuck alone in polyurethers. So for me this is a quite interesting story and just before we we sign off I am going to quickly let's have a look at the history of Zon and prestige papers that's it. Like I said, these names are just absolutely ridiculous and I cannot remember them to save my life. But over time, you start to remember them. And it's one of the reasons why I think starting with Legends Mode makes so much sense. Because it gives you some basis in which to start your game. And, and, and there are names that actually make sense. And you, you can actually look and say like, oh, that's that person. And eventually you get a map of, of what's actually happening in the game. Because it's completely procedurally generated, every game is completely different and the history is completely different. So when you start a new world and start a new game, it makes sense to actually spend some time to get familiar with that world so you, you get some of the backstory. Otherwise you start playing the game and it just doesn't have, make any sense. And you're going around, you play adventure mode, and you're going around and you're, you're killing ducks or whatever, but you don't know why you're doing anything. Um, and I find that that the real problem with the game. Um, when you play fortress mode, it's a little better because you're actually a bit isolated. But even still, you get people coming in telling stories of some king somewhere, and you're like, I have no idea what that's about. So it, it takes a lot of the kind of depth of the game away from it if you don't do this. And this is why I really recommend it. So having said that, let's look for Zon Prestige Papers, which I actually just see right here. So he's a male dwarf, born in two. And so, um, so he's the only son of Bukar Tapered Lash and Zasid Quickness Helms. In 14, when he was 12, so that's when he became an adult, he immediately became general of the town of Sculpture, because I think it's because he's the only one left. And then the next year, he made a journey to the depths of the world. So the depths of the world is, is kind of a dangerous place to go. He chained, tamed the giant Olms. He came back to Poly Rooters. So he, he made a quest, right? In 18, he journeyed to the depths of the world and he tamed voracious cave crawlers. Uh, and then in the year 35, he, then he made another journey and he tamed the elk birds. And then finally in the year 54, he went again and he tamed the rutherers of the depths of the world. So this guy is actually, if you played the game before and you, you're like, okay, this guy's going by himself into the depths of the world <laughs> and beating up these monsters, this guy is actually pretty pretty buff I mean this guy is this guy's a real deal in the late winter of 108 uh, he became obsessed with his own mortality and sought to extend his life by any means and I suspect the, he's the only member of society of his society and I think that this is probably a big deal for him so now we've now delved into the history a little bit of the world we've got some idea of what's happened now I haven't gone through and shown you kind of the wars of the of the thing i had intended to do that but obviously we're well 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 over time and it's just going to get really boring i think if we just keep delving into history so in the next episode what we're going to do is we're going to start an adventure and i i've decided because i think this story is just so gripping to me this guy who's the last of his of his civilization he's living in a ruined fortress by himself so I think that we should have an adventure we should go and meet this guy let's talk to him see see what he's up up to and what what he's been doing so I think that would be quite fun it's not going to be a long series adventure series we're literally just going to be tourists we're going to come down there we're going to try and meet this guy in Polyrooter see if we can even find him we may not be able to find him it may be impossible but let's give it a try until then this has been Udo Udo Niwa, and we have Udo Udo quite a lot in this episode. Um, next time, um, I think we will Udo Udo quite a lot as well, but uh, hopefully it'll be quite a lot of fun. Until then, I will see you later. Mm -hmm.